Good afternoon. I'm Diane Hebert Murphy, Provost and Vice President Academic, and I'm honored to be reading this citation today. The highest distinction the Senate of a university can confer upon an individual is an honorary doctorate. At the University of Manitoba, the criteria include distinguished achievement in scholarship, the arts, or public service. Our honorary graduate this afternoon is Jennifer Gunter. For more than 27 years, Dr. Jennifer Gunter has made outstanding contributions in medicine, accessibility, and our understanding of reproductive health, sexual health, and menopause. Once referred to as the world's most famous gynecologist, this physician, best-selling author, and women's health expert has long been an unapologetic advocate for patient empowerment and accessible information. Her approach as an OBGYN and a pain medicine physician is centered on evidence-based medicine integrated with a focus on empathy and the patient's experience. After graduating from the University of Manitoba's Max Rady College of Medicine, Dr. Gunter completed her OBGYN training at the University of Western Ontario and a fellowship in infectious diseases at the University of Kansas. The traumatic loss of one of her sons in a premature triplet pregnancy motivated her to write The Preemie Primer, a complete guide for parents of premature babies from birth through the toddler years and beyond. The book addresses the lack of publicly available, medically sound information about the, the specific needs of premature babies. Since then, Dr. Gunter has authored two more books on female health, including the number one national bestseller, The Vagina Bible, which she wrote as a reaction to the large amounts of false and dangerous information about female health on the internet. She has written for the New York Times, Glamour, The New Republic, and many other publications, and has a blog called The Vagenda. Her prominent social media presence has led to the nickname Twitter's resident OBGYN. She often references her Winnipeg roots and credits her prairie upbringing for her confidence and direct approach. Since 2006, Dr. Gunter has been managing a health clinic for women in the Chronic Pelvic Pain and Vulvovaginal Disorders Division at the Permanent Medical Group of Kaiser Permanent in Northern California. She is the host of a 10-part docu-series called Gensplaining on CBC Gem and a TED Audio Collective podcast. She is a passionate champion for women's health and has used her voice to debunk medical myths advocate for a better medical internet, and call out exploitative pseudoscience. Her goal is to have more medical experts involved in, in disseminating medical information in ways that are accessible to the public, and to correct the misinformation and disinformation available online, especially as it relates to women's physical, reproductive, and sexual health. Madam Chancellor, it is an honor for me to ask, on behalf of the Senate of the University of Manitoba, that you confer a Doctor of Laws honoris causa upon Dr. Jennifer Gunter in recognition of her outstanding contributions to the field of gynecology and her lifelong advocacy for accessibility and women's health. By virtue of the authority vested in me as Chancellor of this University, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of Laws Honoris Causa with all the rights and privileges thereto appertaining.
I now invite Dr. Gunter to um, address convocation. Well, thank you so much, and I'm so thrilled to be here. And I just want to say that um, now everybody knows what a hot flash feels like. <laughs> OK? Just so you know. So uh, President Benarash, Chancellor Mellon, graduates, family, friends, I am honored to be here and actually really stoked to be speaking to you and very honored and humbled to be getting an honorary degree. You know, when, when I was asked to give words to send you on your way, I thought, wow, that's such a great honor. And what was I thinking? I started thinking about what was I thinking when I was sitting there. Uh, and I started to formulate my talk. And I got really excited about it. And I came up, and I was coming through immigration yesterday. And uh, as they do, they ask you why you're here. And so normally, I'd, you just say, well, I'm going to Winnipeg. And I was born in Winnipeg, so no one, that's fine. But he said, well, what are you going to Winnipeg for? And I said, well. I'm speaking at convocation at the University of Manitoba because I was really proud. And the immigration official said, well, why do they want you to talk? <laughs> and I thought, you know, I'm going to change my little talk a little bit here now. Um, because there were all kinds of things running through my head. It's one of those moments. And sometimes I'm kind of known as the burner of bridges, which can feel really good in the moment. But sometimes there's also consequences. And I'm also known as the person who speaks out and isn't afraid, but I'm also not stupid. And the person at immigration has control over whether or not I'm going to make my connecting flight. So instead of saying, if I were a man, would you have asked me? I simply said, I'm one of Canada's national treasures. <laughs> To which he replied, well, I've never heard of you. And I said, well, you have now, haven't you? And so that was it, and I was on my way. Um, I never thought that I was going to be a public truth teller, someone who was going to stand up about what needed to be said in many ways. And it wasn't until I had my own personal health experience, I'm a little embarrassed to say that it took that for me to actually know about all of the communication issues and all of the way that disinformation is weaponized to harm people. And so it really became a mission for me. It became something that I couldn't not do. I had to help people in this way because seeing people in the office, seeing people suffering because they didn't have the right answer or they had difficulty navigating the healthcare system was something that was just an awful thing to me. How can we do all this amazing research? How can we have all this good data, and yet we can't get it from A to B? And so that was really a very interesting thing, because I never thought, as a medical student sitting here waiting for my degree, that this is where my life would take me. And so I want you to, first of all, think about being open to opportunities and to take chances when they're there. So when I see you all sitting there, I'm reminded of when I was here so many years ago in 1990. Uh, and it was also very hot. I was very hot sitting there. But it wasn't hot because it was so hot. I was hot because actually I was starting to get unwell. And by the end of the session, I had sort of reached back and realized I had lymph nodes the size of golf balls. And I thought, oh my gosh. And I went through, of course, being a medical student, the first thing I thought I had cancer. Um, but then I worked through it and realized I had mono. Uh, which is true, I did. Um, and I was supposed to start residency in two weeks, but I, the next day I was completely bedridden. I couldn't get out of bed. How was I going to drive to London, Ontario with mono and start residency in two weeks? So I had to call, and I had to explain what was going on. And instead of what I thought I would get, because I was talking to a doctor, that I would get some kind of compassion and some kind of empathy, what I got was, well, that doesn't work. You have to start. And so the answer that they gave me was that I would take all of my vacation up front as sick leave, and then I would have to work 11 months straight. And that's, in fact, what I had to do. I had to start not recovered from mono and work 11 months straight. And that's when I got my first taste of what systems are like. When you're a student, you learn things and you, you think, oh, it's going to be so easy to enact this. And then you get out in the world, and there's system issues. 
And so I decided when I was a senior resident that I would do what I could to fix that system when I was finally in a position to change that. And so I actually changed the call system so I took more calls so my junior residents had more time off. And I'll tell you something, I've met some of those residents now 30, almost 30 years later, and that's the thing they still remember. They still remember that I did something to make the system more humane. So whenever the opportunity comes up where you have a chance to make the system more humane, do that. It will make you feel better, but the impact it's going to have for everybody else is really astronomical, really. Now, the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is how well trained you are. You are really at one of, and really in my mind, the best university in the world. I received amazing education at this university. And when I went off into the great big wide world, because sometimes when you live in Manitoba, you have a little bit of like a provincial inferiority complex, you know, and you, you know, you go to Ontario. And at the time, I mean, when I, when I was training in, in, uh, in the 1980s, we didn't have an MRI scanner in Manitoba. We had to send people down by ambulance to North Dakota to get MRIs. So when I started residency and someone said we're going to send someone for an MRI, I'm like, oh, are we calling an ambulance to send them to the States? And of course, I thought I was from Hicksville because we didn't have an MRI scanner. Um, and so, you know, and then when I moved to the States, I was I'm going to be working with people who went to all these big name universities and they always tell you when they went to a big name university, they tell you before they say anything else. And I, they really do. I mean, the big joke is how do you know if someone went to Harvard and don't worry, they'll tell you. Um, and so, and that's really true, it really is, it's not a joke, it's an observation. And so what happened was when I went to the States, I thought, wow, how am I going to hold up with all these big dogs? How am I, how am I going to hold up? And you know what? I held my own and better. I didn't encounter one person who I felt had a better education than I did. When I went through medical school, we were one of the first schools to do a pass-fail system because we were told that we needed to learn how to be a doctor, not learn how to get an A. Those are not the same things. And so when I was at a big university in the States and I've been working there for a while, um, I had a colleague who uh, went on and on and on about the importance of an Ivy League education and how one couldn't get anywhere in life without an Ivy League education. And this was also one of those bridge burning moments, um, but I took the, the match. Um, and I said, wow, Thurston, because his name was something like that, you know, and, and to paraphrase C.S. Lewis, he deserved it. Uh, and uh, I said, wow, Thurston, I went to the University of Manitoba and you and I have the same job. And it was true. So what I want to leave you with is to know that you are well trained. To know that the system is going to sometimes rail against you, but you're trained to deal with that as well. And also, sometimes it's OK to burn a few bridges. Just you know, think a little bit beforehand to make sure that's what you really want to do. So I want you to go out, think big things, do great things, and remember you learned how to do a lot of those great things here at the University of Manitoba. Congratulations, everybody.